Uh, have you noticed in your travels, and most of us have been in and out of enough different churches and, and uh, environments, that preachers come in a variety, kind of like Baskins and Robbins, you know, with their, what is it, 39 flavors, or what, is that right? Is that they're still doing that 30, 49, 59, Heinz 57? <laughs> It, uh, you know, Grace says there's only one, what are you, your chocolate mint? Oh, no, oh, 31? I don't know what it is. And, uh, you can see how often I hang out there, right? Okay. But uh, have you noticed that preachers come like, like B&R uh, in a variety of flavors, shapes, sizes, backgrounds, <coughs> likes, dislikes, personalities, uh, experiences, and you can add on to the list quite a bit if you really can you know, that uh, uh, there are oftentimes the backgrounds and the experiences along with peers, uh, what environment you've been educated in and your cultural background and so forth uh, brings about an ideology perhaps uh, that uh, provides a, any individual uh, speaker and, or preacher you know, with kind of a personal perspective. Um, he's a blend oftentimes of a lot of different aspects, but how that is actually packaged in the ongoing polishing of a, of a preacher uh, is a little different than the next guy. Kind of like mint chocolate ice cream is different than Rocky Road. Uh, you know, there's uh, some similarities, but sometimes some differences as well. The writer of Hebrews lived in a Roman culture, but there was a Roman culture that was heavily influenced uh, by the Grecian culture that it had subjugated uh, a couple of centuries before. Uh, you, a, a great illustration of this type of influence uh, would probably, as good a one as any, would be Ephesians chapter 6, where Paul, in one of his, what we call a prison epistle, uh, where he was under house arrest, writing to the Ephesian church, used the illustration of a Roman soldier. Okay, uh, You remember that? You know, the breastplate of righteousness, the helmet of salvation. You had shin guards and, you know, loin guardian, you know, and then the offensive, you know, sword of the spirit. Uh, you know, that type of thing. Well, that would have been what God used to illustrate the spiritual battle that we find in spiritual warfare that chapter 6, beginning in verse 10, throughout the remainder of the chapter actually addresses. Uh, you know, we find ourselves today coming in our ongoing study of the book of Hebrews, coming to what I've used the term connective text a transitional text, you know, one that reaches back to what has already been covered in the book, as well as introducing that which is going to uh, be brought into play during the ongoing chapters and really for most of the rest of the book. Uh, the previous sections that we've seen as we've gone through have talked about the superiority of Christ compared to the angelic world, uh, compared to Moses and the Mosaic law system, and so forth. And it contains some warnings. It contained a warning of neglect in chapter 2, the danger of hard-heartedness, the danger of apathy, the danger of just letting things slip by, the danger you know, of uh, you know, not responding you know, to the truths of God's word uh, through that, okay? But the highlight that we look at today is a very, you know, short text for the, the time frame is uh, because it's only two verses. Uh, Hebrews chapter 4, verses 12 and 13, uses a, a weapons illustration. It's an illustration about a Roman sword. And it uses this to get our attention as well as being a connective to the dangers and the warnings that have already been presented and then going on to connect us beginning in verse 14, Lord willing, subject of next week and so forth, 
uh, with the high priesthood of Christ. Okay? And in between those two major portions, multiple chapters on both ends, you've got these two little verses that connect uh, and give us some descriptive characteristics uh, of, in this case, very specifically, the Word of God itself. Okay? Uh, now, these are in contrast. You know, we're talking about, you, the writer of Hebrews used a physical illustration that came to, God brought to his mind about a sword and how it is utilized in certain situations that we'll talk about as we go through the rest of our time this morning. Uh, but uh, these two verses actually contrast the Word of God against the picture of a physical sword. I'll try to explain that a little bit as I go. Now, we'll just take a moment or, or two here and talk about uh, the types of swords. Uh, many of you may not have really any interest in long, big long knives that impale people uh, one way or another, whether that's in movie life or you know, Alibaba and the 40 Thieves, or maybe you watched Errol Flynn. You know, it, uh, you know, some of us are almost old enough to admit to watching his daring do from the pirate ships and webbing and all the other stuff that is there. Okay, it, uh, well, you have scimitars. Now, these are normally Arabian, Mid-Eastern type of thing, long curved blade, normally used from horseback. Uh, you have the cutlass. That's Errol Flynn's baby, you know. It's, uh, the, uh, and there's nuances that I'm not going to bore you with that all make sense if you understand, you know, how these weapons were utilized and what types of battle against what type of foe, you know, and so forth. Uh, you have the broadsword that we think of, you know, King Arthur and his knights are in, around the, you know, you've all read those, right? Camelot and the, the whole thing. Uh, these are great big honkers, you know. I mean, they're, they're five feet, six feet or more in length. It takes a strong guy to pick one up with two hands, you know, <coughs> let alone use. But they were designed for mounted battle during contests, you know, where you use them, you know, from a horse against uh, primarily uh, unmounted, you know, enemy forces. Uh, you know, but you know, we stylize that in Hollywood and everything that goes with it. Uh, you also, of course, get uh, another form would be the saber. Uh, the saber was much more lightweight. Uh, you think of, like, for instance, Civil War. Uh, it was used in the, con in the continent a lot during the Napoleonic era with the warfare. You know, and so forth. Uh, can be very effective, still used primarily as ornamental by our armed forces, you know, with the officer corps and so forth that goes with that as well. So there's different types of things there. Now, the thing is, when you go to the book of Hebrews and you flip it open to chapter 4 and you read the following verse, or well, you just read these two, he says in verse 12, especially for the moment, for the word of God is King James word is quick. It means alive, living. Okay? That's a King James word that we don't use that way anymore. That the word of God is alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing and dividing asunder of soul and spirit and joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Okay? Uh, this, uh, you say, okay, so which one of these swords are we talking about? Well, actually you're talking about none of them. You're talking about one of these. Okay? Uh, this is the working man's blue-collar sword during biblical times. And there are different names for them. Uh, this thing is stinking sharp, believe me. Okay? This is a real-life, I mean, it's yeah, you could say it's a replica, it's a modern, but this is a functional sword. And with no effort whatsoever, I could cut an arm right off of any of you. Okay, if you held still, I could decapitate you without even making an effort out of it. On top of that, it's so sharp and it's edged on both sides. You want to be pierced with this thing? I can run it right through you and have six inches sticking out the backside of you faster than you could possibly imagine. Okay? These things are good. They were designed by and for the Roman legions of the day. 
Okay. They were designed to be one-handed for a very real reason because your Roman battle flanks, you guys remember the centurions had 100 soldiers and then you had you know, all the different military things that worked up through. Okay, when they came in, when you had uh, this, these battle flanks came in in the wedges, and that's how Rome ruled the world with this iron legions for almost a thousand years, you know, they had a shield that was strapped to their left arm. Didn't make any difference if you were right-handed or not. In those days, you all fought the same way. Yeah, and that shield was four and a half feet tall, went all the way to your ankles almost, and came all the way just to the top of your head. Yeah. These things were fought, you know, with, you, know, you worked as a unit. You want to talk about teamwork? Yeah, there very much was teamwork. Yeah. These things were used by your foot soldiers in two different ways on a primary basis. Uh, the one way was when the swords or when the shields had an opening, they would thrust through the, in, the shields, almost overlapped. Okay? It, uh, you know, and the, the, the guys with the spears, your pike men, were the, next, were the next row back. And at command, those shields would open just enough for the pikes to thrust through. Okay? At which point, you as the soldier would also thrust through. The pike would go over your shoulder into the top of the enemy. You would go underneath into the bowel section or into the top of the legs. You know, and then you would hut, hut, and you would step forward one step and you'd pull the sword out and stab right down through the enemy as he laid under your wounded. Okay? And then you would recover and then do the same. These guys could flatten march over anybody that stood in their way. That's why they were called the Iron Legions of Rome. Okay. These things were the primary weapon. Okay. And they are a weapon. They really are. It, uh, I wanted one for many, many years, and Emily spent a lot of money getting me this one. So, you know, no, it's not a toy. Trust me on that. Okay. That is the picture of the sword that you're talking about here. And most of them ran 21 to 24 inches in length, dual edge pointed on the front. You can look them up on the internet. There's a whole gamut of this stuff. Okay, they're, they're, and they were designed for in within that battle flanks, that complex, that tactical format of going at an enemy and conquering him. And this is the picture that the writer of Hebrews uses within the culture of the Roman era. Okay, to drive his point across is, let me tell you what the Word of God is like. Hmm? Okay, let me tell you. you know, I used to use a different knife uh, you know, for the, a particular demonstration at you know, like Bible camps you know, and ranch camps and canoe camps and stuff. Made a lot of fun because he, I could always in those days, wind up with a watermelon <laughs> to show you how effective these things actually are. You know, and those were nothing like this thing. This thing, you know, those were like butter knives compared to this thing. Yeah. I wish I'd have had this, you know, because, you know, just, you know, yeah, it, uh, impressive. So you get the idea of what the Roman short sword, what this picture that's going to be thrust right to the front of the mind of anybody reading this and says, this is what God's word is like, okay? With some distinctives. says it's alive, it's living, okay? It's an actual living thing. It's not static, it's not dead. It's, you know, it's not just laying there, this is alive. Okay, and powerful, the word we get energy from, energeo. Okay, the idea is in, in used in relationship to God's supernatural power. Okay, something that is a living force all on its own, everything that goes with it. Sharper the word, and they, I know I'm not the word studies, that, but they, I think, help here. It, sharper means to literally to cut clean. In other words, you're not... You know, we often think of, you know, well, if I had a sword, I'd just hack on the guy. No, it isn't. It's not used that way. You know, it, it's to cut clean. Guy raises his arm, you take his arm off. You know, it's just that simple. You know, and then talks about piercing, the dividing of sunder. You know, you know we all know about the hot knife into butter. Okay? Uh, that's what these things will do. Okay? Uh, 
to an unarmored individual, yeah, they just slide right through the ribs and right out the back and right back, and they cut going in and out on both sides. Okay? Uh, they are an extremely effective, very intimidating weapon when you go against 10,000 Roman legionnaires lined up in battle flanks of hundreds as they interlock and all the shields overlap. And you're out there with your Tonka toys, you know, and your dark guns, and you think, this is not going to be a good day. Okay? The Word of God has that kind of power, has that kind of supernatural ability, you know, to pierce sharper compared to any, as sharp as this, and this thing will. You want to touch it with your thumb? You'll probably lose your thumb. You'd better pay attention. The thing is that sharp. Okay? And the humanly, God's word is so much sharper than any human weapon that you can't really compare it. Okay. Yeah, that's what the word of God has the capability. Uh, to penetrate, to divide, uh, divide simply means to cut off, to cut from. Uh, you get the idea. Get the, yeah, it's God's word will penetrate, okay? Then slice into component parts. It'll just whack it to pieces, you know? It, uh, you get the idea. And then it talks about soul and spirit and joints and marrow. Uh, you know, interestingly enough, at least the people in the medical world tell me, joints don't actually have marrow. The bones have the marrow. But the joints themselves are formed differently. At least that's what I've been told. Uh, it doesn't really, I don't think, makes a difference for the point of this illustration. Uh, but soul and spirit are two component parts of the human being. You know, you've got, according to 1 Thessalonians 5.23, body, soul, and spirit. You go back to the book of Genesis in chapter 2, and you find that when God created Adam out of the dust, he breathed life into the physical body and he became a living soul. Okay, talk about the component parts. You see, we have a tendency just to see a human being and we think that's it. That's it. No, it isn't. You know, the, the soul spirit is also part of the component parts of the makeup of the entirety of the human being. So what we're talking about here with God's word is something that penetrates into the innermost parts of a person. It pierces them through and through. And it'll cut going both ways anytime it's wiggled. Okay, that's a technical term for your sword arm. Okay. Okay. On top of that, it goes on and says it is a discerner, a Greek word, could have cost. Uh, it's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. That discerner word, it's an idea of a blend of discriminatory examination and the decision-making judgments that are produced by that examination. It's a much richer meaning than just discern at a surface level. It's, it's a lot more the nuance than that. There's a lot more impact when we talk about the Word of God being discerning, being capable of reaching down inside and examining. It, uh, wow, some stuff. Yeah, we get the word, and uh, you probably recognized it, right? It's like critikos. Critical, critique, criticism, okay? That's where the, all those words in the English language come from, is that Greek word, okay? Being able to be discerning what the Word of God is being talked about right here in this passage. The thoughts, well, you know, we're not talking about daydreams, are we? Yeah, you know, not at all. We're talking about the deliberation that you utilize when considering an issue. Should I this? Should I that? Up or down? Left or right? You know, uh, you know, good or bad? Pursue, run away from, whatever it happens to be, you are dealing with making a discernment because using the thought process. Now, intent, you might think, why did, why did God include the word intent? Because the intents of the heart speaks of the morality. Okay. When you start talking about the intent 
of the Word of God, you're talking about having a moral compass. In other words, right and wrong. And right and wrong according to what God says is right and wrong, not what the contemporary culture might say is acceptable or right or wrong or true or untrue, but what God's Word defines in those areas. And I would point out to you a little two-letter word that we utilize in the English language. It says, the Word of God is. Now, I don't want to bore you with English grammar. But is does not mean was. Is does not mean could be. Is means right now, present, continuing tense. This is what is happening. If it was, then it happened previously. If it could happen, that means it might happen in the future. But it says the word of God is alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Not could be, should be, might be, sometimes is, and on the third Tuesday of the month, you know, it might apply. No, no, no. Uh -uh. This is a full-time, ongoing, operative situation when it comes to the word of God and what it does, its power and everything that goes with it. It... Uh, you know, which implies, at least, because there is no limiter put on this, it implies that it's going to keep right on being is. It never becomes was, it's always is, which means, in implication, it's eternal. It's unchanged, unchanging. Uh, it's incorruptible. It's immortal. Okay? The Word of God is going to continue to exist and continue to do and be what these characteristics indicate forever. Uh, so it's not, you're not going to have to worry about next week or next year there's going to be a different standard or that God's word is going to change or you're going to have to adapt to some different theological thinking. Not at all. The word of God remains the word of God. It, uh, i give you a couple of examples. Both happen to be from the, the Apostle Peter. In 1 Peter 1.23, he says concerning believers being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which lives and abides forever. Lives and abides forever. Okay? In 2 Peter, he started the epistle this way. According as God's divine power has given to us all things pertaining to life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature. And the passage goes on. Through the knowledge of him. Where do we get that knowledge? Right here. Okay. This is the written word of God. And then we have the spirit of God that takes the written word and shows us the truths of it and the applications for it. Okay. Over and over you see these things. So what you have when you, you know, pull out one of these things that is illustrated by the sword of the Spirit, okay, is you have God making the declaration that my word will penetrate the spiritual being while sifting through, analyzing the thoughts and motives, even the very morality of your life, okay, while providing the truths of God as your yardstick for comparison. Got that? See, so it's not just poking somebody with two feet of steel and ruining their lunch. Okay? The Word of God is something that has eternal implications and it's, a, it's an amazing thing because when you're around one of these a little bit in whatever form and then you say, and God's word is immeasurably sharper, more powerful, more living, more capable, you know, in every characteristic, much more, much more, just like Jesus, much more than the angels, much more than Moses, much more than, well, 
Yeah, and he's going to go on and talk about chapters of much more than religion, much more than the uh, priesthood of the Old Testament system and so forth, the connective that's there, okay? Jesus put it this way in John chapter 6. Many, and he's done some miracles and then done some teaching and most of his followers had kind of gone, wow, that's pretty heavy stuff. That's some serious, we're not sure we're comfortable with that. And, you know, they went out for pizza. Now they left, whatever they did. And many of his disciples, it tells us, beginning in verse 60, when they had heard this, said, this is a hard saying. Who can understand it? When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples were murmuring, he said to them, does this offend you? And when you see the Son of Man ascending up where he came from before, he said, you think you're offended now by my teaching? You just wait until I get resurrected and I'm caught up in the clouds. He said, boy, that's going to get your attention. What are you going to do with that? If my teaching impacts your life, how about death, burial, and resurrection? How are you going to cope? You better get a grip on some of this stuff. That's what he said. If you will see the Son of Man ascend, it is the Spirit that brings life, quickeneth. There's that word, that quick word again. The flesh profits nothing. The, ready for it? The words that I speak to you, they are Spirit and they are life. Jesus had a really high value system when it came to God's word. You remember what John 12 said? Jesus said, I'm not telling you my point of view. My father is telling me what to say, and I'm saying it. So when you hear me, you're hearing the father. If you refuse to hear me, you're refusing to hear the father. And that's what's going to judge people right there. In the high priestly prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane, remember that great uh, prayer when he knelt and, and you know, before he was seized and taken to the cross? And he said about his disciples, after talking about the spiritual warfare, you know, protect them from the evil one, keep them from the spiritual warfare, the harmful effects of evil and unrighteousness, he said, sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. Sanctify, the hagios word, it means to make holy. Set them apart for, to honor God in his holiness. How is that done? Well, through truth. You can't honor God through falsehood, through lies. God's only honored when his children live in truth. How are we to know which choice to make, which path to walk? The word is truth. Clear back in David's time. He said, how will a young man know his way? Thy word is a lamp unto my, unto my feet and a light unto my path. And it hasn't changed. God's word has always been the stellar yardstick that we need to measure our own choices and actions up against. See, that's the idea. So the question arises, why don't people read, study, insert, whatever adjective there. Why don't people read God's word? Hmm? We read everything else. Okay. Okay. You want conviction? How much time do you spend staring into your smartphone compared to staring into your Bible? Ouch. Yeah. Or magazines or the silliness of YouTube. You know, or whatever it happens to me. Now compare that. Just I don't want to. Yeah, I, I don't want. This is not true confessions. I don't want anybody <laughs> crying on the floor here. Or anything. You know, but just stop and ask yourself: How much time do I spend in that other stuff? You know. Now you. I've had people tell me uh, throughout my many years of ministry, and I've been guilty of claiming the same thing. I just don't have time to read my Bible. My goodness the time I waste with my face in a computer. Eh? You really don't think you're going to get spirituality and godliness you know, out of watching TikTok videos, do you? 
I mean, there may be a place for watching videos to learn how to do stuff and for pure entertainment, but please don't tell me you don't have time. You know, I try that on myself at times. I go to and I tell God, you know, I just didn't have time to read the Bible today. You know, and he reminds me of how much time I dinked around with my head in the smartphone. You know, kind of convicting when you think about it. But don't take my word for it. You know, go back to Isaiah chapter 55. Okay, those of you that are uh, associated with the deacon or deacon, the Gideons will recognize this one, right? It, uh, you know, the, don't have time, of course, to do the whole chapter, but start with me in the, the famous part, verse 8 of Isaiah 55. God writes, My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your, your thoughts. As the rain comes down, the snow from heaven returns the, to it and waters the earth and makes it bring forth fruit and, and bud. He said, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goes forth out of my mouth. It will not return to me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please and will prosper in the thing whereunto I sent it. God's word is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Yeah. Uh, it's really quiet. It's, uh, you know, there's a couple of different reasons. Number one, we seldom really keep, keep a hold of this. We're in a spiritual war. And Satan is going to do everything he possibly can to keep you away from the weapons you know, and the armor that will protect you in that battle and give you an opportunity to fight back. That's the armor in Ephesians 6, and that is the sword of God, sword of the Spirit mentioned here again in Hebrews 4.12. He'll do everything he can to convince you that you're too busy, that you're just too tired, that you just can't make room for it today, whatever it happens to be. And if Satan doesn't trouble you, go look at the person in the mirror. That one should scare you to death. Because that person looking back at you is the most selfish individual you will ever run into in your life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because, boy, that old nature of I want gimme, 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 lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. Man, people like me at least, maybe you guys are, are far beyond this, people like me, boy, I know that we struggle with some of this stuff. We really do. Okay. It's uh, you know, spiritual warfare, rough stuff. You know? And we need to put on the whole armor of God. We need to have the sword of the spirit, everything that goes with it. Well, in Ephesians chapter 4, the companion verse uh, here in verse 13 puts it this way. After describing the word of God and its active supernatural abilities you know, and everything that goes with it. Speaking of this, he says, neither is there any creature, in other words, nothing in creation that is not manifest in his God's sight. All things are naked and open to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. In other words, with God. We are going to interface with God continually. This is a shift. We went from this illustration of the sword being the word of God. Now we're talking about God's omniscience. Nothing is accepted here. It says in all of creation, there are no exceptions, all things. You know, naked, really technical term. You know what naked means? It means naked. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's just that simple. It means nothing's covered up, nothing's hidden. Hidden. Yeah, yeah. Did you notice? I, I don't know. But most of us, you know, we get out of the shower and we're toweling ourselves off and we just happen to glance into the bedroom and there's that full-length mirror 
and we see and we think, Bleh! you know, it's, uh, we go, that needs work, right? Yeah, yeah, well, we're spiritually, we're as unclothed as that image in the mirror in the sight of God. God knows the thoughts and intents of the heart. Yeah, he knows what's going on, everything that goes with it. Open, open before him. Now, trickleinzo, Greek word, it actually, uh, yeah, kind of funny, it, uh, at least to me, uh, it talks about naked and opened unto the eyes of him. That word means to seize by the throat in order to kill. That's the way it's used in the Roman world. You know, open. In other words, you are grabbing somebody by the throat or the neck, bending the head back in order to open up the vulnerable head area to take one of these swords and decapitate or slit the juggler vein or some combination thereof. You know, what he's talking about here is God's word clearly exposes our thoughts and our motives, just like that mirror when you're telling yourself off. Has a tendency to make us uncomfortable, doesn't it? Remember, I said, why don't people read and study the Word of God? It can be awfully convicting at times. Of we're falling short. We're not everything God wants us to be. Uh, yeah, it can make us we squirm a little bit, don't we? At that time, okay? God sees all, knows all, and is going to judge according to his standard, which is the word of God. Not according to mine, not according to any preachers, not according to any religion, you know, outside of biblical Christianity, because that is based upon the word of God itself. It lays why they don't, you know, now we know. I mean, it's at least one of, if not the major contributing factor of not wishing to read or study the Bible, okay? lays the soul bare and you simply can't hide from the truth of your spiritual nakedness. God's not going to cut you any slack. He says, no, that's the image. That's what you're seeing. Wow. Okay. Now, in the Hebrew context, we're talking about bubble people. And these people that weren't really sure whether Christianity was worth giving up Judaistic religion. The bubble people would be required to give an account of how they were responding to the new and living way, which was Christ and his finished work of the cross. Okay? That's right here, right in the word of God. And now they're going to be held accountable to that new standard. Okay? You know, you want to know power? The Bible has a number of illustrations. Remember Jonah? Forget the fish thing. Jonah was the guy that, against his will, God compelled to go to Nineveh. It was the capital of the Assyrian Empire. They were not nice people. And he went there and he preached that God, in his judgment because of their wickedness, would destroy the city. And the people from the king down repented. An entire city, hundreds of thousands, Oh, yeah, I know. You can quibble over you know, every little guy everywhere. That's not the point. The city, as a city, repented in sackcloth and ashes. Ashes and God spared the judgment. Why? Because God's truth was preached to them. And the word of God has that kind of power. Okay? And I had a lady, I'm not picking on the gals here, a lady about a thousand years ago, give or take a couple of centuries, that told me, you know what your problem is, Roger? You use too much scripture. <laughs> and I said, would you run that by me again? You know? So you use too much scripture. People don't want to hear all of that scripture stuff. You know? They want just a little bit and then for you to, ex to talk about it for a while. I said, why would they want to listen to me? When you've got God talking, why not listen to God? You know, I mean, I thought, well, okay, uh, but, you know, I thought about that seriously for at least a quarter of a second <laughs> before I rejected it completely, you know, and ta-da, here I am, 
No, never mind. You've got to get the idea. <laughs> Romans 10, 17 says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Now, we use that to so if you want to condense it, faith comes through the hearing of God's word. Okay. Now, we often use that evangelistically, right? Share the gospel with somebody. They need to believe in the truth of God's word. They need to hear that. How can they hear if a preacher doesn't go and so forth? Uh, the whole passage in, in Romans 10. But while that's very true and it's a fantastic evangelism verse, please pay attention to the fact that your faith is not designed to be a stagnant commodity. You're saved by grace through faith, but your faith is what continues to energize. That's that energeto <coughs> of the word of God so that you can then serve and honor the Savior that did save you. In other words, you don't stop with a dose of faith, and that's good enough. Remember what they used to tell you with polio shots? Get a polio shot, you know, and your arm falls off. Uh, you know, and one will do you for the rest of your life. That's not the way faith operates. Faith saves you and says, now that's the first step. That's the saving step is the salvation now Go live in faith and in grace day by day, step by step for the rest of your life. How do we know where the path should go? Ta-da! Again and again and again, right? Just like Peter, stuck record. Uh, you younger people don't know what I'm talking about, but anyway. Now some of you do. Yeah, yeah, yeah don't you? Yeah, let me see you out here. Uh, yeah, I think most of you probably at least have seen records in your parents' old closet someplace. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, anyway, you've got to get the idea. So, evangelism, yes. We are to, Peter says, to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Faith and grace are something that just didn't occur once at the moment of our salvation. They're designed to, you know, be part of our lives and to guide and direct us as well. Okay? You know what that takes? It takes supernatural enablement. It takes a living commodity. It takes the supernatural energy that only God's word is guaranteed to have when utilized by the Spirit of God. Okay? Now, you can blunder through your Christian life trying to do it in your own strength. And you're going to get awfully beat up if you do. Okay? Because no human strength is going to be able to cope with the warfare that the wiles of Satan, who is the god of this age and of this world, is going to bring against you. Watch out. Now, put on the whole armor of God and then pick up that sword. Learn to utilize it correctly. Okay? It, uh, it's your primary offensive weapon. Don't, don't make the mistake. The Word of God does change lives. It changes people from one eternal destiny to another, and it also changes the path and the steps of our lives as we journey along you know, with our Christian life. Father, thank you. As we do come before you, praising you for your watch care, your love. Uh, Lord, you're providing the power, the living energy, of something that is supernatural. And forgive us, Father, even as you convict us and encourage us you know, to be better students of your word, you know, to read and grow in the knowledge of who you are, what you've done, and what the capabilities are, and how to protect ourselves against the enemy, even how to protect ourselves against us. Uh, Lord, thank you for the privilege of knowing that and that you love us that much in Christ's name. Amen. Steve.